So with the car now in my garage, I'm going to turn my attention to doing some leak finding among all of the battery plates because during the test drive I noticed a whole bunch of water basically that had pooled in the back seat underneath some of the plates. I'm also going to check the fronts just to be sure, basically the whole thing, see if I can find any more that need fixing. So the plan for finding this uh, troublesome leak is I'm going to disconnect the tubing connected to that bottom plate that I believe is the problem one. Ooh, shit. Do I have to plug that? Nothing. Crap. Wow, that's a lot of water in there, actually. So the plan for finding the next leak is I'm going to disconnect the tubes going to the bottommost plate, and then I'm going to add some of this uh, UV fluorescent dye as well as more distilled water. And then once it drips out, I should hopefully be able to actually see where the water's coming from. All right, that didn't spray water like it did last time I had that off. So I'm just gonna zip tie these to here to hold them upright. And then I've got a pipette. Now it doesn't actually really give a uh, like a proper amount, like here's how much you add sort of deal. So I'm just gonna add a little bit. It's a little less than half a milliliter. Yeah, that's working. So now I just need to wash that down with some of the distilled water so it actually gets into the cooling plate. Thankfully, I only managed to suck up the distilled water, not the green shit. All right, that's mixed around in there now. So now, I just have to basically let that... Oh, great. Well, I think that answers that, but all... No, I think that might have just been a little bit of splash. It's hard to... Hard to tell. There's plenty of other things glowing, so I may just need to give that some time. So I'll let that drip over the course of a little while and come back and see if any has actually splashed around anywhere. Well, nothing really leaked out of that bottom battery plate overnight, so I'm just going to hook everything back up and go for broke with the die in there and see if that allows me to trace the leak down. Hopefully without spilling a bunch of water all over the car this time.
All right, power on. Here goes nothing. No drips. That's good. Still nothing leaking. Well, it sat overnight and no extra fluid came out, so I'm just going to keep putting fluid in it and see until I can get something to leak. Well, it seems I've found where all the air was hiding in the motor circuit rather than the battery circuit. Um, which makes me a little bit suspicious that perhaps the leak is coming from somewhere around the battery charger slash DC-DC converter. It's in the right place, and there are some connections back there that are difficult to see. So maybe once the die starts leaking out, we'll be able to test that theory. Well, I was able to operate the pump at the highest power it can be set to, and yeah, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't really work very well at that setting, but on the bright side, it didn't blow up any of the plates like that. The main loss from that action was this little glowing drop there. Just so far, all I can find that really leaked out. Everything back here is still appears dry. And there is nothing yet under the seat in the problem area that we had last time. So for tonight, I'm gonna leave it there and then I'll come back tomorrow and I'm sure it'll be full of water or maybe not, who knows. With a little more JB Weld held on there, it's all good. I haven't found any other leaks. So now I'm going to start working on the BMS tap wiring. Here in the driver's side rear seat is where I mounted the battery charger and battery management system. So this is the actual BMS itself under here. Those three connectors on the front are where the batteries each cell plugs in there so that way it can monitor every cell for its voltage. This is an essential component of the charging system and I haven't measured the battery's individual cell voltages. I'd really like to know that since it's been sitting for so long because that'll give me better information to make sure that they're still healthy. There's also some to be done about the other connectors on the BMS uh, as far as supplying it with 12 volt power CAN bus current reading, temperature sensors, and things of that nature. To perform tests with the BMS for the time being, I've simply set the 12 volt battery up in the front seat here, 
where I can just kind of screw the BMS's power wires onto the terminals. And then on top of the car, I have a MacBook Pro reflashed with Linux, and that is running the Orion BMS software, which then talks to the BMS through this CAN adapter. So this is the CAN bus wire coming out of the BMS, and then this just hooks up to the laptop via USB. Here are the completed BMS tap wiring harnesses. I'll walk you through them. On this end are the connectors that go into the BMS units themselves. Each of these has the connections for up to 36 cells. And I've got three of them giving me the capability of 108, of which I use 100 for the 100 cells in groups of 10. So then on the other end, we've got the actual connectors that go into the batteries. These were supplied with the batteries. They're Molex CTX50 series, I believe. Each connector has 10 pins, but of those, usually only five or six are actually populated. The wiring harnesses come through the firewall at this end on the passenger side, and then the harness branches out onto the different cells that are in the engine bay. What I've done in order to fuse these wires, which protects both the wiring and the BMS itself, these fuses uh, originally came with leads on them to be soldered into like a PCB, I believe. I couldn't really find a good solution for a compact way to have all these fuses and actual fuse holders. So instead what I did was basically just solder the wires on to each end of the fuse. I'm not super thrilled at the idea of having those soldered connections though, but what I did to kind of mitigate the risks of that shaking loose was using this glue filled heat shrink over the whole assembly and that does a pretty good job of mobilizing the joints. And then the actual connector has crimped terminals inside that crimp onto these small wires, a short section of which runs to the fuse, and then all the way back to the BMS. I figure that this will give me still decent protection because it's not like these wires are going to carry a whole lot of current even if they do make contact with something. And they're short, but they're still short enough that they shouldn't really cause a problem for the BMS's measurement or balancing operations. The fuse is rated for slightly less than what the internal fuse of the BMS is, so it should blow first, because these are much easier to replace than the fuses that are inside the actual unit. So obviously on this end we have the fuses that go in the engine bay, so that covers the first 60 cells. And then here we have the one that covers the next 10 cells. This is the seventh module. It kind of has to get spliced onto these other two because of the 36 cell groupings. While the next of the rear batteries get served entirely by their own connector. So this also tracks with the decision of where I put my isolation switch because the isolation switch is between two of these, between the number two connector here and the number three connector here. The BMS has isolation between the actual connector groups of 36 up to 2,500 volts. So that way, if I open up that switch, it won't be a problem for the BMS. If I were to put that switch between say, the engine batteries one through six and the rear batteries seven through 10, then that would be a problem because it would fall between this red bundle here and this yellow bundle here. And between those bundles, there's only 250 volts of isolation, which is quite a bit less than the actual pack voltage. So it would try to drive current through the BMS in order to power the car's systems if one of the relays were to be closed at that time. And that would blow, all, that would blow a bunch of fuses on my wiring harness. So here I've got my temporary setup for testing out the BMS tap wiring. 
So you can see the tap wires kind of laid around behind the batteries. I did have to remove the AC compressor in order to reach some of the connectors. I've zip tied this front set to a post and then run the wires out towards the back of the car. And then one of the cell groups is just going in the window to the rear pack. I've also gone ahead and just installed the bus bars to bring the pack up to full voltage. Right now these aren't bolted in since I don't expect them to carry any current. They just need to basically equalize the voltage so that my cell tester can see whether or not my cells are wired correctly. So Mike from the DIY Electric Car Forms has very generously loaned me his cell tap validation tool. And what this does is you plug one of your cell tap banks into the top here, and it will test it to see whether or not it's wired correctly without risking damaging the BMS itself. So just flip it on. We are using the standard BMS, so just, so just hit the button to test. And we've got some errors. So we see number 11 and 12 have an error. So to figure out what went wrong, let's have a look at the voltages. So for bank one, we can see the voltages increase by 3.4, 3.5-ish volts per cell the whole way until we get to the last couple cells that appear to be open. So we'll have a look at that in a minute. Uh, on bank two, we're reading all zeros, which is not good. And on bank three, and on bank three, looks like we've got something wrong there as well. So I will get to figuring that out. Okay, looks like it was just a simple matter of the bus bars not being tightened. So I went, I torqued those down and now all three banks read good. C for correct on all batteries. C for correct on all taps. C for correct again on all taps. Voltages look all right. Okay, let's try the next bank. Still an error on the last bank three of this tap group, which is, I believe, these wires that go to the rear pack. So let's see what's up with that. First bank is all good. Second is all good. Hmm. X. Here's the bank one voltage is bank two. So bank two ends at 85.5 volts. And that jumps, whoa. So it's kind of going backwards. So that's the volt, so 36 is at the voltage that the front ended off at. And then 25 is the front plus that module. So I must have the connectors swapped or miswired or something. So I'll try messing with those and see if I can get this working. So after reviewing the output of the tap validation tool and consulting the documentation I have for the connector pinouts, it appears that what I've done is I've wired the connectors for this module as a type LN module, but the module is actually a type LP module, which if you examine the pinouts, you would see that the it's basically flipped from one another. So all I need to do is take those connectors out, take the pins out, put them in the other way around, and then we should be good to go. But before I do that, I'm going to check the last three modules. All right, so here's all the rear, the last three batteries wired up. Now you can see we've got warnings on all three banks, but if we look, you'll note that there's a whole bunch of C's with a couple Z's at the end. Likewise, likewise. So look at the last three voltages and you'll notice they're all the same. That's basically because we've got three connectors with 12 cells worth each, but only 10 cells per connector. So those last two 
are basically wired to the same cell as the one before. And that's okay, which means that these three batteries are actually good. And you can see it steps up 35 to 71 and then to 106. Now all I have to do is fix that connector that was wired up for the wrong type of battery and then it should be good to go. So now I basically just had to reverse the pins on two of the connectors. Bank three shows worn, but if we toggle over, you'll see that it warns because the last two cells are at zero volts, but that's correct. You'll see they read 121. Um, and that's the same thing as the last set where that bank only has 10 cells on a 12 cell tap set. So the last three are wired together. With all my errors reduced to warnings, that means it's safe to connect the tap connectors to the actual BMS. I did so, powered it up, hooked up the software on the CAN bus, and we can now see pack state of charge. It reads as 70%, lowest cell voltage 3.4, sorry, lowest cell voltage 3.541 volts, highest cell voltage 3.558 volts. So only a few hundred, only a hundredth of a volt or so of difference there. And the total pack voltage right now is 355 volts. I had to, in the battery profile options, to do this configure which cells are currently connected thing. And basically you have to check a box for each cell that's actually present. But I was able to use their automatically populate thing and it actually picked it up completely on its own. So that was pretty easy. I'll tell it no to not update that. And so with that, I can move on to other testing of the BMS, power up some more of the car and try out the current sensor as well. Start working on getting all my temperature sensors set up, that sort of thing. With the BMS tap wiring all tested and then removed again from the car, I have also started on another piece of the project by draining out the coolant. So that's right now just distilled water with a little bit of leak detecting dye in it. I'm not super happy with that because when I was working on some of these plates, I noticed a little bit of goo in one of the tubes, which I'm a little worried about. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do about that is make sure there's nothing in there by moving the system from pure distilled water to distilled water plus some amount of antifreeze. I don't know if I'll go with the full 50-50 or maybe just enough to make sure that it's a good biocide, but I'll work that out when I actually get back to refilling it. The problem with doing so, and the reason why I'm draining it and working on it, is because I've got these PVC components right now in the loop and as I understand it, the PVC parts are not really going to handle having antifreeze in it. Now, getting that four-way manifold on the output of the pump was a real pain in the ass, and there's a lot of different parts in these, and I don't really wanna to have to try to find all those in nylon or polypropylene and then figure out how to put it all together. So to avoid the difficulty in finding exact replacements for the PVC parts, it occurred to me that I have a 3D printer and it is possible to 3D print nylon, which has decent resistance to antifreeze. I also did a little Googling and found out that it's possible to print polypropylene, which has excellent antifreeze resistance. So I went ahead and designed these. These are just PLA parts right now that I printed out for checking that they've got the right dimensions and stuff. But this replaces that PVC manifold and it actually does so uh, quite a bit smaller, which is nice. It never hurts to save a little space. I've also added some vent holes to the top. It's tough to see, but down in there you can see kind of where it splits into four and then comes out here. It's very blocky compared to an actual fitting, but that's partly because I didn't want to spend too much time screwing around in Fusion, partly because it's a lot easier to print when there's a nice flat surface that I can set on the bed. This manifold's a little bit easier to do in actual parts, but I'd figure I would give it a shot at printing it anyways. Um, this is the flow splitting for the intakes of the pumps. 
it's impossible to see down there, but it bas it just splits from this one into these two, as well as a vent hole up top that I can drive a little stainless screw into once I've vented the air out. Once I fit check these, I'm gonna have them basically printed on a much higher end printer out of polypropylene probably. Uh, I haven't decided yet whether to use the powdered stuff or basically just an FDM like what I have, but that should allow me to make these a little bit smaller than they are now while being much more resistant to chemicals.